responding to order to return from closed session. Of the city council provided. The city council provided direction to the city's labor negotiators. There is no reportable action. Roll call. Vice Mayor Cruz. Present. Council Member Malson. Here. Council Member Campion. Here. Council Member Lampson. Here. Mayor Hewer. Here. Please join me in a moment of silence and flag, followed by flag salute by Director Chris Arrakis. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Video statement. This meeting of the Galt City Council will be cable cast on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel, on the Comcast Consolidated Communications and AT&T UVerse cable systems. The meeting is closed captioned and webcast at www.sacmetrocable.tv. Today's meeting will air Friday, March 23rd at 9 a.m. and Saturday, March 24th at 9 a.m. The City Council meeting videos are also archived on the City's website and a DVD copy is available for checkout from any library branch. Reports by City Council members on regional boards, commissions, or committees. Mr. Campion? Nothing tonight. Oh, my public comment. No. <laughs> oh, presentations. I'm sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay. Um, new employee introductions. I think Public Works has the first one. I'd like to invite Carlos Solorio to join us here at the podium and uh, uh, while he's coming up, I'll kind of give you the inside scoop. Uh, we're thrilled to have Mr. Solorio. He started with us about three weeks ago, just in time for the budget tsunami to overwhelm us. And uh, <laughs> he's been running ever since uh, tirelessly. Uh, he comes to us with a bachelor's degree from UC Davis in political science uh, with an emphasis in public administration. And he has a minor in Spanish. Um, so uh, he uh, comes to us with some fluency skills and writing skills as well. Uh, he is previously employed uh, for the last decade or so with Napa County in various positions. He started with their Health and Human Services and their Alcohol and Drug Services uh, Division and took a promotion into Public Works for Napa County uh, where he was integrally involved with, among other things, running uh, a cemetery district uh, for the department uh, and uh, helping them with their budget process. And uh, uh, did such a great job there that the county executive officer grabbed him from Public Works and promoted him up as an analyst uh, within the uh, county exec's office where he got to do budget reviews and work with many departments, among other things. So uh, we're thrilled to have him. He has a, a wife and two children. They. Uh, signed paperwork last night to sell their house in Napa and are working to uh, transfer that into a final escrow to purchase here in the city of Galt. So he's all in and uh, going to be moving his family in the weeks ahead. And uh, he likes soccer, boxing, which is a lot like budget process, I think, and gardening in his yard. So uh, we'd like to say welcome to Carlos Solario. Thank you, Mr. Very welcome and be very honored to be part of the city of Galt. Um, uh, not only in the area of public service, but also as a resident. Good. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. She's been a resident of Galt for nine and a half years and has two school-aged children and a husband, Peter Vegas. She graduated in 1999 with honors from Cal State Hayward, which is now called East Bay. She has a bachelor's degree, a bachelor's science degree in business administration, where she focused on accounting and computer information systems. Prior to the city, she worked for the Galt Joint Unified Elementary School District. Boy, that's a mouthful. As their accounts receivable clerk for three and a half years. She brings over 15 years of accounting experience to the city of Galt, 
We are really happy that she's on the team. So far, she's just come out of the gate running, and we're just delighted to have her here. In her spare time, Laura Ann reads and walks. She also sometimes rides her bike to work. So please welcome Laura Ann. Thank you. <laughs> I gotta go get my bike so I can. <laughs> <laughs> you have an umbrella? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Next presentation: Operation Earth Project Green Art Exhibit, the Galt Youth Commission. Good afternoon, City Council. First of all, thank you for having us on behalf of the Galt Youth Commission. I know you guys are a busy set of individuals, so we'll get right to it. I'm Sally Gonzalez. And I'm Christian Gonzalez. We're both serving our first year at, here at GYC. I'm a senior at Galt High School. And I'm a junior at Galt High School. And I'm co-lead of this project. And I am the publicity chair of the commission and this project. So as you could have probably guessed from the title of the presentation, the exhibit this year revolves around the theme of climate change, which is kind of an umbrella term, but includes topics such as wildfires, pollution, hurricanes, deforestation, as well as its consequences, which include <laughs> animal extinction. So some factors of animal extinction that we're going to have in the our exhibit are, for example, turtles choking on plastic bags and the destruction of natural habitats. As well as coral, coral acidification, the thinning of our ozone, etc. And this year, we've kind of made a collaborative effort where we've been able to reach out and talk to not only the elementary schools, not only the middle school here at McCaffrey, but as well as the two high schools, Galt High and Liberty Ranch. So our, our objective and goal with this art exhibit is to bring awareness of upcoming state mandates for creating or like encouraging recycling so we can become more green. And aside from this, we also want people to develop, explore, and communicate ideas revolving the theme of climate change in hopes of you know, sparking conversations in families and the community in hopes of bringing some change. Mm -hmm. And this year, it's been a bit different. In past years, we've just plastered the poster on our walls and kind of had individual artists come, like spend their time after school, mostly students, and they just submit it. But this year, as previously mentioned, we reached out to the schools rather than the students. So we kind of did, uh, we talked to the teachers to kind of see if we could like put this project in tandem with their curriculum to see if it fits. And we've been very successful in doing that. Mm -hmm. And it also differs from past art exhibits because in past art exhibits, it's kind of just like paintings and you go see the amazing paintings. And we're also gonna have that this year, but it's gonna be more interactive and we're gonna have things such as like a VR and we're gonna have uh, videos and it's going to be more informational as well. And some examples of cooperations with some schools and organizations are the BFLC, which is a Bright Future Learning Center at our elementary school district. And we have classes such as AVID, Art, the Science Department, Literature classes, Ag, Engineering, and also something that differs from past years is that we have included the public library, so they're also going to be helping us with one of our uh, projects. And although our briefings were with the teachers, what we tried to do this year was kind of a chain reaction. So the passion we had for this project and the excitement for it, we spread it to the teachers. So that way it kind of created this con contagious passion for the exhibit in hopes that that passion would spread to the students. So from us to the teachers to the students, and from those students kind of make a communal effort because those students will talk to their friends, their cousins, their tios, their tias, their aunts, their parents, and kind of bringing in the whole community at this exhibit. Mm -hmm. And even though this is a different type of exhibit, we're still keeping the youth perspective at the center. And via this art exhibit, uh, students will be able to express their concerns about certain um, issues. And this is actually a painting that was done by a, a McCaffrey student after he read one of our articles at, in the Galt Herald. So the purpose of this PowerPoint is to officially invite you as the council members to come join us and support us. The event is going to be April 20th from 5 to 9 p.m. 
And it's completely free, so feel free to bring family members and relatives to come join us. And if you have daughters, sons, grandchildren, nephews, please, uh, we have an uh, a project, as previously mentioned, with the Sacramento Public Library. It'll be next week, and they'll be doing those cute little butterflies. Yeah, those cute little butterflies, as well as some bees made out of recycled material, which will be uh, shown at the exhibit itself. So if you have grandchildren interested in doing that, please bring them next week. It's March 27th from 4 to 5. Mm -hmm. So just a little correction. It's the library here in Galt. Oh, yes. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Any questions or concerns? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Sacramento YOLO Mosquito and Victor Vector Control District Annual Report. Gary Goodman, General Manager, welcome. Yes, hello. How are you just uh, doing this evening in a little bit of the rain, which is a concern for us kind of moving forward. But we always appreciate the fact uh, that you invite us. I don't know necessarily whether you invite or we force ourselves onto the council to try to give you an update on mosquitoes, everyone's favorite topic. But um, we are anticipating a little bit of change more uh, uh, this year. We want to try to make sure that we're touching base and see uh, what the activities are going to happen for us. So, again, just a recap in terms of our district, we cover both Sacramento and Yolo County, so all the way down from the Delta through Galt up to Rancho Marietta, um, all the way up to the Roseville border, and then all of Yolo County, so it's about 2,000 square miles. Uh, and we have technicians essentially assigned uh, to each one of these areas that go around and look for mosquito breeding sources and then treat accordingly. Uh, we also have a network of surveillance, what we call traps. So we trap mosquitoes on a daily basis um, and then bring those mosquitoes back to our lab, separate them by sex and by species, and then make sure that we're testing them to see if we have virus activity. Uh, the other activity that we do in terms of uh, uh, virus detection is dead birds. So if you do see a dead bird, you can um, go to our website, fightthebite.net, uh, report that dead bird. Um, and then we'll come out, we'll pick it up, uh, we'll come back and test it, um, and then let you know whether that bird died of West Nile virus or whether it died of not West Nile virus. If it has tire tracks on it, it probably was the car, um, <laughs> but, uh, but we'll let you know if we do detect some level of virus activity in, um, in that area. So there's certain things for us in terms of mosquito habitat that we look for. Wetlands obviously are a big concern for us. Agricultural areas, those things are very easy for us to spot. Um, rice fields is what we have quite a bit of in Natomas and Yolo County. Uh, you have standing water with vegetation, uh, produces a lot of mosquitoes. These things are very easy for us to spot. You can drive right down the road, you can see standing water, we can go check it, um, and then monitor the mosquito population from there. Uh, but some of the backyard sources are the ones that we really struggle with. Um, we have an ongoing active swimming pool program uh, where we do flyovers um, over residential parts of uh, both Sacramento and Yolo County trying to look for green pools. Um, and so that way we can visit those and either, either uh, take care of that problem um, or at least uh, inform the resident that there might be an issue with mosquito breeding. But a lot of things, and especially after these recent rains, you're going to have a lot of containers in people's backyards that are going to fill up with water. And so we want to make sure that we're reminding folks, dump those things out. But if you have any questions or concerns, give us a call. We typically come out within 24 hours. Um, we'll help you dump out or identify where those mosquito breeding sources may be so that you're trying to protect both yourself, your family, and your neighbors. So we use what we call integrated mosquito management measures. The first is public information. We have a very active uh, PR program uh, in terms of going out to public events, uh, doing neighborhood association groups, a lot of evening presentations, a lot of fairs, and those types of things, just to try to get the education out. Uh, we also are very active on social media, and then, of course, we, we even have an advertising program. So you'll see billboards, you'll hear radio ads, um, even television spots to try to make sure that we're letting the people know what issues are coming up. That will start to ramp up as the weather warms up a little bit. So once we kind of get into April um, and May a little bit is when we start to see more of mosquito activity. Uh, and so you'll start to hear and see more of that uh, outreach that we do. Uh, then we do what we call surveillance. And again, that's just setting traps throughout the district, um, making sure that we're uh, trapping those mosquitoes and then seeing what kind of fluctuation we're having with the population. Is the population rising in a particular neighborhood from week to week? Uh, are we sensing virus activity, those types of things? If we do detect something like that, then that's when we'll go through kind of our chemical control aspect. Um, we also have a biological control program. It's mosquito fish. Um, so we have at our facility in El 
Elk Grove, we have 23 ponds that are dedicated towards breeding mosquito fish. We, we plant about 4,000 pounds per year just in Sacramento and Yolo County. We're probably the largest mosquito fish breeding facility in the, in the country. Um, so we're very proud of that program as well. And it's a good natural way to uh, plant those fish in places like rice fields or wetlands or things like that where they'll eat the mosquito larvae and kind of take care of the problem for us. But we provide that free of charge. So even if you have a backyard pond or something like that where mosquito fish might be very effective in, uh, we'll come out and plant those free of charge. Then we have a physical control program, which essentially is, is working with um, uh, landowners or entities like U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, uh, Nature Conservancy, uh, anything like that to, to make sure that we're communicating to those landowners, here's what you can do to help reduce mosquito breeding on, on your property. Because any uh, standing water, especially again after these rains, and we'll see what kind of uh, issues we have with flooding with, with the McCollumy and the Kasumnas River and having an impact on some of the sloughs that we have, especially down in the Delta, uh, we'll work with those landowners to make sure that they're trying to make, uh, keep that water off of their property so they're not breeding mosquitoes. And then we go again, I, I reference the control aspect. So our technicians go out on a daily basis looking for mosquito breeding sources, we'll treat with larvae side, but if we do detect virus activity in the mosquito population, we'll do adult mosquito control. And that's anywhere from a backpack to an ATV to a truck to even airplane over uh, large scale areas. So um, and we've never actually had to have an airplane over Galt uh, for the most part, and I'll show you a little bit of graph of what we saw last year in terms of West Nile virus activity for you. Um, but we've never had a huge problem here in the Galt area. Uh, we also work very closely with uh, the neighboring district because you guys border right on San Joaquin. Um, county, and so we work very closely with San Joaquin <coughs> County Mosquito Control. Um, so any mosquito problems that you are having is probably mosquitoes from San Joaquin that are making their way across the border, um, but we'll still take care of them for you. So the concern that we have um, in terms of mosquito production um, is, uh, is obviously diseases, and West Nile virus is the biggest one that we have a concern with. It started in 1999 in New York City and within four years steadily made its way across the country. Uh, so we've had it here established in California since 2003, and we continue to have a number of cases associated with West Nile virus, and this is the most prevalent disease in the United States um, from a mosquito-borne standpoint. <laughs> But mosquitoes can also transmit other diseases like dengue, malaria, chikungunya. Uh, a lot of people have heard of Zika virus that was in the news the last few years. Um, still a concern for us. Um, and then dog heartworm. This is the time of season, the springtime, which actually dog heartworm is more, most prevalent. Um, there's a specific species of mosquito called Aedes syriensis that breeds in tree holes. And tree holes get their water essentially from these recent rains. And so after these rains, in the next few weeks, you'll start to see um, a different species of mosquitoes that will come out, and those can actually transmit dog heartworm. So uh, we have an active program with the, with the vets within Sacramento and Yolo County. We send out uh, mailers to them on a, on a monthly basis to try to track where the dog heartworm cases that they're diagnosing are um, so that we can try to do local control in and around those areas. Um, as I mentioned, for West Nile virus, this is kind of a... a, a a big chart of the number of cases that we had last year uh, in California, we had 538 human cases, um, confirmed human cases of West Nile virus. Uh, the one issue that we have really associated with this is that West Nile virus is really underreported. Um, so 70% of these cases are what we call the neuroinvasive form of the disease. So you have almost 400 cases of people that actually had to be hospitalized um, because of West Nile virus. Um, but there are a lot of other cases if um, West Nile virus manifests itself originally as kind of like flu-like symptoms. So a lot of people, if they just get, the si if they get sick, they start to experience symptoms, they'll just stay home for a few days, they'll start to recover and everything, you know, and then they, they'll get better and they'll go back to work and they never even go to the doctor to get diagnosed. Well, conceivably that could be West Nile virus as well. And so it becomes very much underreported. Um, so CDC estimates that for every neuroinvasive form of the disease, you have another 30 to 70 cases that go unreported. So you're really talking about thousands of people um, within California that are being stricken and, and impacted by West Nile virus. Uh, we also want to make sure that people recognize that West Nile virus can be a very debilitating disease. So while the neuroinvasive form of the disease, uh, which can lead to paralysis, blindness, and of course even death, um, even the mild form of the flu-like symptoms um, can be very severe. Um, and so those flu-like <coughs> symptoms, for some folks, um, as you get a virus introduced into your body, it wants to fight it off. Um, so you feel crummy for a couple days and you feel really bad for a few days, you're in bed, and then you start to recover a little bit. That's typically how the flu goes. Well, think of that worst part of the flu lasting for 
maybe just a couple days, but also even weeks or even months on end. So um, it can be much more longer lasting than the flu. So we want to make sure that people can take the appropriate steps to, to protect themselves. Uh, there was a study that was done by California Department of Public Health done uh, back in 2005 that um, interviewed folks that, were, that had some level associated with West Nile virus, and 50% of those people were still feeling some effect one year later. So even the people that just had the fluke type portion still has an impact on their lives even a year later. So that's why we want to make sure that people are taking the appropriate precautions to try to protect themselves. So here in Galt, actually, the, this is your city limits here, and this is the activity that we detected last year. So uh, the yellow uh, uh, triangles there are dead birds. We only had detected two dead birds, uh, positive birds, uh, for West Nile virus last year, uh, and only two mosquito samples that, that were close enough to the city of Galt. So uh, for some reason, it, it's interesting. Galt and, and West Sacramento are two pockets of populations that we just don't detect a whole lot of virus activity. I don't know why. Um, clearly, you guys are doing an excellent job of uh, keeping down the mosquitoes. Um, and, our, and our technician down here is doing an excellent job as well as to keeping them down. So we just don't detect a lot of virus activity out here. We do a lot of sampling, a lot of trapping um, in the area. So, um, but, uh, but just north uh, of you guys in Elk Grove, we have a tremendous amount of activity, but it just never seems to kind of migrate its way south, which is a good thing. So just to give you an update as to what we had last year um, for West Nile virus activity in the Galt area. Um, I mentioned the, those, some of those, um, uh, what we call uh, different diseases, dengue, malaria, chikungunya, uh, and Zika. Uh, one concern that we have are these invasive mosquito species. These are mosquitoes, um, uh, worldwide there's about 2,500 different species of mosquitoes. Not all of them transmit disease. Um, it's not just one mosquito. Um, but, uh, and some of them are very specific to particular regions of the world. In our area, we have about 22 different species of mosquitoes. Not all transmit disease, um, but these particular mosquitoes, the Asian tiger mosquito and the yellow fever mosquito, are diseases that typically were found in South America, Central America, and Mexico, and are starting to way, make their way into California. Um, so they haven't been detected here in, in our particular area, but they have been detected in um, Madeira and Fresno, which is not that far from us, and very similar climates. So these are ones that we're keeping an eye on, because these are a very efficient vectors of those other diseases, dengue, chikungunya, and Zika, which can essentially be transmitted um, from human to mosquito and then on to human. And we get cases about or so, uh, about a dozen to 20 different ca uh, cases of dengue, malaria, chikungunya um, in Sacramento County. Those are all in what we call imported cases. So somebody traveled to, say, South America, got bitten by uh, an infected mosquito, and then came back here and exhibited symptoms. And so if we get these particular types of mosquitoes established in our area, we could have local transmission, and that's the concern that we have. Um, so with this partic these particular mosquitoes, they tend to be more active um, in the daytime. So what we talk about with mosquitoes is um, try to stay indoors at dawn and dusk. That's when mosquitoes are most active. That's when they're looking to try to, to bite. These mosquitoes will be more active in the daytime. Uh, so if you're being bitten in the middle of the day by mosquitoes, give us a call. We want to know. It will come out immediately. We want to try to check that out uh, to see if we're getting these types of mosquitoes established. So what are we anticipating for 2018? Um, it's difficult to try to predict, but um, we saw a big increase in West Nile virus activity during the drought, which is uh, a couple of years ago, which was a little counterintuitive because you think, well, mosquitoes need water. So if you have less water, you'll have less mosquitoes. And while that's true, uh, because West Nile virus is a bird disease, it's, um, it, the reservoir is a bird, it's transferred by mosquitoes. Mosquito bites an infected bird and then passes it on. Uh, wherever we did have water in those drought years, we had both the congregation of birds and mosquitoes in the same place and it tended to amplify the virus. Um, so last year we saw a, quite a big, uh, a sharp uh, drop down in terms of virus activity because we had more water sources available and so we think that kind of helped spread it out. This year will be very similar, especially with the recent rains that we've had um, and, and water shortages, uh, or um, I'm sorry, the availability of water. Uh, we may see a similar year to what we've had last year. So we hope that that to be the case. But that wet spring obviously is going to bring on different levels of mosquitoes, and we'll try to keep track of those as best we can um, as, these, as the months start to progress and we get into the summer season. So what we ask folks to do is to follow the seven Ds. Um, you know, in your property, drain any standing water, especially after these recent rains. Make sure you're not breeding mosquitoes on your own property. Um, dawn and dusk are times to avoid being outdoors. This is when mosquitoes are active and they're looking to try to bite. Um, during the day, it's really hot, especially here in the Sacramento area. Um, you know, you get 95 degrees. Mosquitoes are really small. So if they're out in, in the middle of the daytime, um, 
they're, they're not going to survive very long. So tend, they tend to kind of hunker down in dark, damp places uh, during the daytime, and then they come out in the evening time, and that's when they're hungry and they want to feed. So if you can avoid being out during those times, that would be preferable. Um, dress in long sleeves and pants. Um, um, I do on a regular basis, uh, mostly because I'm a, I'm a ginger and I burn in the sun, uh, but it also <laughs> helps in terms of trying to uh, defend yourself from getting bitten by mosquitoes. Um, defend yourself with an effective repellent. So we uh, provide repellent. Um, by We buy this stuff by the pallet. Um, so we have a ton of it in our, in our warehouse. I forgot to bring some today. I'll apologize, I'll rectify that later this week. Um, but if you have an event, um, an outdoor event, especially you know concerts in the park or movies in the park or anything in the park in the evening time, whatever the case may be, give us a call. We'll provide the repellent. We want it to be used. And so um, please just let us know. We'll be out there uh, very quickly to provide information in that repellent. Um, doors and screens should be in good working order. So uh, in the evening time, we get that Delta breeze, it tries to cool off the house. Make sure that your doors and screens don't have any holes in them. Mosquitoes are really small, and essentially what they're doing is they're picking up the carbon dioxide that you exhale. That's how they find their, their, their host. Um, so uh, they're really crafty, so if you've got a hole in your screen and you've got that window open, they'll find it. Um, so make sure that you're repairing that, uh, not just a plug for Home Depot. <laughs> Uh, and then district personnel, if you're being bothered by mosquitoes, if you see mosquitoes, if you know of a neighbor who has a bad pool, if you just see standing water, give us a call. Um, this is what we do. We always want to try to get other eyes and ears that are out there. We can't see everything all the time. Uh, so we really just want to know whether there's a problem. And you typically, again, we have uh, uh, the, the technicians have uh, computers in their trucks. Um, we'll try to get you out actually the same day. But worst case scenario, we'll be out within 24 hours to take care of the problem. We understand that quicker we can deal with it, the better off we are long term for the season. So um, with that, you can get more information. There's our phone number, 1-800-429-1022, or visit our, our website at fightthebite.net. And with that, the council have any questions? I talk fast. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very good. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll make sure to bring repellent tomorrow. I, I, I apologize for that. Thank you. Have Thank you. Day. OK, so back to item F, agenda approval, additions, or deletions. Staff, is, staff has requested the J5 be pulled. They have further information. From the consent calendar. Any others? Now, public comment. Mm -hmm. Under Government Code Section 54954.3, members of the public may address the council on non-agenda items. Speakers may address city council on any agenda item during consideration of the item. Speakers shall restrict their comments to issues that are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the city council and limit comments to a maximum of five minutes. Please fill out a speaker sheet located on the table inside the entrances to council chambers and forward the completed speaker sheet to the clerk. Do we have any public comment? The ones I've received all appear to be at the time of the item I'll call. Okay. Information consent calendar, J5. Oh, I'm sorry. Back to reports by city council members on regional boards. <laughs> commissions and committees. Tom? Uh, let me see. Well, it was coffee with the cop and then um, the state of the city report, which you hear more about, went to both of those. But I, and rather than pulling the agenda item off the consent calendar, I would like to speak to item J4 and thank the staff and the, uh, the, audit, the audit selection team that we had. I mean, they did a great job, uh, particularly our, our treasurer. I think he did very well. <laughs> yeah, he definitely did. Yes, he did. <clears throat> so uh, I'd like to thank um, Verna, Emily, and Sean. And this also includes, and I'm sure everybody wants to know, it also includes a audit report on AB 3773. Okay? So that's also included. That's it. Thank you. Mark? Uh, well, I, too, attended Coffee with Cops. That was a lot of fun. Yes, it was. That place was packed. Uh, as for other items, uh, SACOG, we had our board meeting last Thursday, and not a lot to report on it other than we did have a one-hour workshop on youth and civic engagement, and it, right now it's in its infancy, but it's, it's mm -hmm. really interesting to see that a community the size of ours is light years ahead of communities like Elk Grove and uh, Sacramento when it comes to supporting our youth and getting them engaged. So kudos to our, to our uh, youth and our youth commission. 
Uh, other than that, and I'll be bringing this up towards the end, uh, there is a consideration as far as Proposition, proposition 69, uh, but I'll give you more information on that at the end of the, uh, the meeting. Thank you. Paige? Okay. Kurt already said no. Already said. I was at the state of the, state of the city, but. State of the city, we had a little, a little meeting working on some Calway, Calway stuff and trying to get to a resolution on that and that is about it for now i attended the greater sacramento economic development council meeting with the city manager um, there was a presentation by brookings institute regarding the regional economy and um, it was really interesting so thank you for taking me <laughs> okay so on to j5 pulled off the Consent calendar. Staff? While Donna's putting up our one slide presentation, which is really the supplemental information, um, this item uh, is a recommendation that you authorize the city manager to uh, execute an agreement on behalf of the city with SMUD, Sacramento Municipal Utilities District, to participate in their first phase of their solar shares program. We sort of have a fleeting opportunity, which is why your staff reports a little light on details, and we'll fill that in just a little bit here. Uh, they actually uh, have had a commercial solar shares program that's been been underway for uh, the last couple of years, and we recently received a presentation uh, from SMUD uh, as to potential city participation in it, and we were uh, coming up on year end when the program was scheduled to sunset, and uh, they gave us a 90-day extension through the next end of next week uh, to get further information and look at what uh, city accounts might be a good fit for the solar shares program in a nutshell uh, certain types of accounts based on time of use energy rates uh, qualify uh, commercial accounts can qualify for this and it's literally a partnership with smud uh, where the city can take advantage of some solar uh, pricing, uh, which is typically less than peak hour market rates, uh, and uh, SMUD will actually design, construct, on and and acquire the property if they don't aren't, aren't doing it on property they already own, uh, and since they have a transmission grid, can actually sort of wheel that uh, solar power to the city, uh, and in exchange, uh, we we have to enter in an agreement that will stay with the program. Uh, for a period of between five and 20 years. Uh, we're leaning towards the 20 year option. Uh, and uh, for eight selected sites as denoted by the red dots and uh, uh, we have flexibility uh, to use them. This would basically be sort of no regrets city accounts. We have probably close to 60 different SMUD accounts around the city uh, and uh, uh, about a about 16 of those would, would be eligible for this program. Of those, we're recommending about half. And the red dots actually represent primarily well sites, uh, lift stations, um, and water treatment plants. Uh, there's sort of no regrets in that there are sites that wouldn't be otherwise suitable for ground mount solar, uh, <coughs> such as the solar farm out at the wastewater treatment plant that was done some years back. Uh, it, uh, you know, where we have property, uh, police department, city hall, the market grounds, maybe the aquatic center, uh, where we have enough room where we could actually do uh, roof mount or ground mount solar. Uh, we're, we're shying away from those at the moment because we're currently undertaking an evaluation of possible energy upgrade projects citywide. Um, and we don't want to preclude that. Uh, once we enter into this agreement, it would preclude us from maximizing that solar potential um, uh, from either a power lease uh, type arrangement or from the city actually putting in the solar and owning it. So we didn't want to preclude that at this stage of the game, but these are sites that wouldn't be suitable for, for ground or building mount solar because they're too small or they would interfere with our, our well systems and things. So uh, we think it's an absolute win-win to partner with SMUD on these eight locations and uh, would uh, recommend that uh, you authorize the city manager to uh, work with the public works and the uh, city attorney to finalize those contracts as a draft contract that doesn't have these locations filled in, but that's the pro forma that we'd be entering into with SMUD, and we have uh, about a week to get that finalized and executed. Any questions? Yeah, I have one question. On the, on the 
the one red dot that's in the county, is that the old wastewater treatment plant? That would be the, the new Live Oak Lift Station, which is actually situated uh, out in the county area. It's in our sphere of influence. Okay, so that's not the old wastewater treatment plant? No. Okay. Well, the answer is yes. I'm sorry, I misunderstood yeah. the question. Uh, <coughs> it is located at the site of the old wastewater treatment plant that is no longer there. And it, would there be physical improvements done then, is what you're saying? No, everything would be done off-site uh, okay. on SMUD-owned property. They have a large farm up at Rancho Seco okay. uh, using that grid that already exists uh, to wheel the power back to the Sacramento region. And uh, that's not a, uh, we don't control where they would site it, but it would be up to SMUD to, to locate, construct the site, and then we'd take advantage of, uh, of a rate break uh, on these eight locations around the city. Okay, so these are just the location where you have usage is what you're saying. Okay. Okay. Okay, so you have a solar power meter, in, in fact. Correct. Yeah. Good. Sounds good. Do we have any public comment? Seeing none, do I have a motion? Move the item. I'll second. Moved by Council Member of uh, Vice Mayor Cruz, second by Vice Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. I got promoted. <laughs> Moved by Vice Mayor Cruz, second by Council Member Molson. Call for the vote. Vice Mayor Cruz? Aye. Council Member Molson? Aye. Council Member Campion? Aye. Council Member Lamson? Aye. Mayor Hewer? Aye. 5 0. Passes 5 0 vote. Okay. Consent, to gen consent calendar. Can you read mm -hmm. them, Donna? Minutes of the regular meeting of March 6th. 2018 and the special meeting of March 13th, 2018. Item two is receive and file warrants for period ending March 8th, 2018. Item three is city council meetings of April 3rd, 2018 and July 3rd, 2018. Item six is the treasurer's report for period ending January 2018. And item seven is amendment number one to the agreement for consulting services with Raftalis Financial Consultants Incorporated for the wastewater cost of service study and update to water, wastewater, and stormwater connection fees. Do we have any public comment? Seeing none, call for the um, we have a motion. So moved. Second. Moved by Council Member Campion, second by Council Member Lampson. Call for the vote. Vice Mayor Cruz? Aye. Council Member Molson? Aye. Council Member Campion? Aye. Council Member Lampson? Aye. Mayor Hewer? Aye. Passes 5 0 vote. City Manager's Office, 2018 State of the City Address. Mr. Palazzo. Thank you, Mayor, members of Council. So a pleasure to be in front of you uh, once again on uh, uh, round two of uh, my presentation of the State of the City uh, Address. Uh, the uh, First opportunity was at the uh, uh, chamber luncheon uh, last week, and uh, we actually my state of city was followed by John Mitchell, uh, that gave us a you know, I thought a great presentation on uh, the the state of the state and the, the financials kind of brought it down to a, an understandable level economics and understandable level. So, um, in my presentation this evening, you know the opportunity is for uh, you can get it aired on on TV and and for the rest of the community to. To see you know, where we're at, and also for the council as I go through it, I have a lot of uh, resources here, you know, with me that can uh, hopefully answer questions if we have questions as I, as I go through this. The uh, overview, challenges, uh, revenue trends, development update, capital projects, and our strategic plan goals, and uh, the process that we go through uh, with our city is. Uh, beginning of the year is, is really establish our strategic plan goals, and we've gone through that uh, you know, several month process uh, establishing those goals. You know, my next step uh, you know, is to implement those goals, and we implement those through the budget process. And uh, you, you, through this presentation, you're going to uh, see you know quite a bit of uh, the strategic plan goals, and you know the projects, and, and you know the priorities on, on where we want to go, you know, with the community and the city. Um, but we also have challenges you know, that we face you know, as a community, and all businesses do have challenges. Uh, our unfunded capital uh, maintenance needs is, is probably one of our biggest challenges, followed by you know, you know, CalPERS and kind of where, where are they at. Uh, Bottomless legislative changes, you know, and that's 
always kind of the, the unknown out there. You know, what is the legislator going to do? Uh, you know, what new laws are going to be passed? Uh, you know, are they going to do takeaways? Uh, we heard a presentation uh, from uh, uh, Cal Waste uh, and their legislative person on you know, some of the solid waste changes that you know, we'll, we'll be discussing in our future meetings and, and what we face. The unfunded capital and maintenance needs, we have a list that we uh, have been working kind of diligently to, to take a look in the last two years on, on where we're at with uh, uh, you know, providing services to the city and, and kind of where are our gaps. Uh, we're pretty, pretty good list, you know, accumulated. We've given some presentations to the council. We're going to hear more, you know, as we go through the budget process. Uh, I learned this evening from uh, Mr. Winkler. I guess I'm getting my you know, boxing lessons out here as I go through the, through the budget process. Um, yeah, and, and you know, really the overall goal uh, is to you know, get, get our, you know, bring to the council a balanced budget. In the past, our you know, uh, expenses have exceeded our revenues. We've balanced it through our, uh, um, our fund balance. Uh, really to try and bring those equal and then you know take some of that fund balance and try and and start tackling some of these um, unfunded capital you know, and maintenance needs um, but we can't do that until we do have a uh, you know a balanced uh, general fund budget positive you know the, everything is is, is those uh, lines are going north uh, as I like to say and you know property taxes uh, transit oxy tax and our sales taxes are, are all, you know, heading in the right direction. Uh, I actually feel a little more confident from uh, our chamber meeting uh, that uh, John Mitchell, that I think we're still, you know, we'll continue this trend in the next uh, year, year or two. Uh, we've had some really great development, uh, you, know, you know, coming to our community. Uh, you know, some, uh, the hotels, you know, Best Western is expanding. Days Inn is uh, under construction. We had the Microtel. Uh, that uh, hopefully finalizing plans and getting under construction, um, you know, some other uh, new businesses. In uh, a month or so, um, our economic development manager will come back to the council. We talked about giving a kind of an economic development update. Uh, we've been uh, uh, trying to, you know, attract uh, you know, uh, businesses out to our, our Simmerhorn uh, commercial project and, and some other areas. And so we're trying to give, we'll bring back, uh, give a, the city council and the community a sense of kind of where we're at uh, with our economic development efforts. The, the building activity is pretty important, you know, not only budget wise, but you know, just providing, you know, houses and homes uh, you know, for our residents to you know, stay and work here. Um, this uh, 2016, we had 134 uh, permits, a single residential permits issue that was, uh, you know, a pretty amazing number. This last year we had about 71. Uh, and, you know, our developments that we have out there are, are getting built out. You know, we don't have a lot of residential uh, lots left. And this number that you see in 2017, you know, our, our crystal balling through our budget process right now, I don't expect that to get above 50 uh, in 2018. You know, the, the lots, you know, just aren't there. You know, it's not, you know, about the demand because people are still wanting to, you know, live and, and, and work in golf, but the demand or the, the number of lots out there just aren't there for the developers to, uh, to construct homes. Uh, but we're working on a lot of tenant maps, trying to get them to the final, final maps, and we have, you know, several different types of housing that are, have been submitted uh, to our community the council and the planning commission recently you know, took some tours of Folsom and Rancho Cordova of kind of a new housing product, you know, for us, a little uh, um, uh, higher density, uh, you know, smaller lots, but uh, you know the houses are you know, you know kind of the same size, you know, ranging from you know 1,500 you know, square feet to 2,000 square feet. The um, you know these types of units do provide some diversity within our community because there's a lot of people out there that you know do want you know some of these you know smaller lot homes uh you know, our general plan you know has you know this location that uh is right behind Rite Aid uh is you know zoned for that and so that application I think is going to the planning commission in April uh Elliot Homes has their application on uh, the corner of uh, Crilly and Walnut and I believe that application will be at the planning commission meeting. So they're you know, kind of moving through the process. 
uh, and hopefully we can get some, you know, you know, some of that uh, on <coughs> under construction, and you know, you know in the next uh, several months. The um, Dry Creek Oaks uh, Senior Development. Uh, this is a real, I think, important project with, for our community. And again, it's a you know, you know diversifies you know the, the housing and the needs. Um, this is a you know, really great location next to the golf course. It's a direct access to our downtown, you know, you know, providing some you know, active uses you know, you know, for, uh, I think, age over 55 is what these uh, 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 single family homes will, will uh, be sold for. Uh, so that's a, you know, another great project that's, that's moving through the system. And then we have uh, oh, the Eastview Liberty Ranch, and we presented that to the council a couple meetings ago. On uh, you know our next steps in, in establishing our CFDs and, and working with the uh, the developer to, to get that uh, underway. Through our strategic plan process, we uh, talked about you know where is our priorities with annexations, and clearly our industrial annexation is our, our top priority in trying to move forward with that. And we're hoping to get to LAFCO by you know summer uh, of this year. Uh, through that process, we also talked about the notch area, and it's kind of new. You know, on the radar for us, uh, but we've had some interest and some discussions on you know you, you know future residential and development out there. But more importantly, which which came up through our strategic plan process, is that connectivity with Carillion to C Street, and you know, bringing that you know East Eric you know connectivity uh, out to the highway. And, and so that is you know you know a focus that uh, we'll be talking about and trying to figure out, you know, what's our next steps in, in trying to make that project uh, a reality. Uh, we talked a lot about the golf market. Uh, in a couple, you know, future meeting, we'll be bringing back some more information. We're still trying to decide our, our direction on that, and, and uh, I think we're, we're close, but, uh, you know, we'll be bringing that back to, to the council with, you know, more of an update in the probably the next you know, two months. The uh, capital projects that uh, we're, we're, uh, we have on uh, you know, moving forward, you know, a lot of discussion this last year on the great improvements that we've seen on our 4th Street uh, promenade. The, uh, we do have some dollars left uh, that we've you know, asked the council to kind of continue to design and spend at uh, a few meetings ago. Uh, so that is uh, still a project that's you know, in, in progress and more will come uh, later this year on uh, future improvements of 4th Street. You know, the two, yeah, I think, real important key capital projects you know, that we're trying to you know, figure out you know, dollars for and put in place is you know, one, the you know, industrial annexation and getting infrastructure out there and, and you know, how, how do we you know, tackle that. But the other key project is this Walnut Avenue interchange. And I think the you know, you know, bold moves that we did uh, earlier or you know, last year in purchasing uh, this property you know, for that future intersection you know, was you know, a clearly a, a real good move you know, on the city council and, and staff's part in moving forward. You know, that, that property was purchased with transportation funds, and want to kind of make that clear. Um, and it was dollars that were you know, set aside you know, only for transportation. This Walnut Avenue interchange is our top uh, transportation priority project. So, uh, you know, uh, plans are in play or we're in the process of, you know, design and kind of looking at preliminary design of that interchange so we can you know, continue to move forward. It's a long process. It's probably a 10-year process to make an interchange happen, but uh, we'll be continuing just, you know, you know, you know tiny steps and, and before we know it, we'll look over our shoulder and we'll have an inter interchange at that location. Uh, large project, $5 million dollar uh, uh, Safe Routes to Schools project underway. Uh, it's uh, uh, going to you know, create two miles of, I guess, new or, or connective sidewalk, replacement sidewalk, you know, within this this project area. Over 280A uh, handicap ramps. You know, it, you know, it's a great project for the community, and you know, applaud the you know, Public Works Department and one of our previous uh, city engineers cobbled you know, a lot of funds together about $5 million to, to make this project happen. You know, the rest of the slides are our strategic goals with our priorities uh, under each, each one of those goals, um, you know, and kind of what, what the projects we should be focusing on and gives me real clear direction on you know, what to you know, focus our budget efforts on as well. Uh, so you know, a lot more uh, reporting out on our uh, 
uh, activity on all these projects as we you know can move through the year. We'll be coming back on a quarterly basis, you know, along with the, our CIP uh, projects to report out to the council on where we're at with you know all these projects. And then, yeah, you know, I think most importantly is our organization and our culture. Uh, is we have my numbers correct here. Last count, 125 full-time employees and uh, 186, you know, temporary, you know, and a few part-time employees within that number. So we have, you know, a lot of employees that, uh, you know, you know, rely on the city, you know, you know, for you know their livelihood and, and their families. And in order to, you know, a lot of discussion at our strategic plan meeting and, and you know, focusing on, you know, our organization and our culture and our training and, and how, what we do provide our employees to make this, you know, great organization. So I, I do applaud the council and, and thank you for, uh, you know, those discussions and, and directions and, and working with our employees. So, uh, big picture, you know, I think we're moving in a real, you know, positive direction. We do have some challenges, but I think uh, as we just, you know, kind of put the pieces together, I call it, you know, the puzzle pieces, we'll be able to, you know, kind of fit those pieces together and, uh, you know, continue to serve our community uh, in, in a great manner. Questions by the council? Um, I just have one quick question and one comment. Uh, C Street overpass took us what 26 years? <laughs> well, maybe maybe I'm maybe I'm underestimating the time there. <laughs> uh, it was it was a process, and um, to get a, you know you talk about housing developments and everything else, but from from initial annexation to actually being able to buy one of those places. How what the time, what's the timeline? I mean, I, I know the answer, but I want to make sure the audience. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to defer to you know the, the expert here, here Mr. I, Rice. I, yep, but, I knew uh, it was coming. Yeah, I don't. You know, with East Liberty Ranch, and you know how long that's been taking. I don't you know, think yep. we're going to see sticks, rooftops going up until probably 2019. Yeah, um, you know, at the earliest. Yeah, and that's a best case scenario. Best we case. yeah we we we're estimating probably 2020 before they go vertical. Yeah. Um, we would like to see that earlier, but uh, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sure everybody would, but you know, you got to be realistic too. So I don't want to get everybody's expectations up that you're going to see all this stuff happen next week. It's not going to be next week. <laughs> yeah, we have a great staff and you know, everybody's working hard to, to kind of move these projects through the system. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any public comment? Okay. Seeing none, we'll receive the report. No motion necessary. City Clerk's report. Subject amend section 2.70.040 of chapter 2.70 planning commission qualifications of the Galt Municipal Code, removing two members of the commission residing outside the city limits but within the boundaries of Galt High School District and within Sacramento County. And amend section 2.75.040 of chapter 2.75 Parks and Rec Commission qualifications of the Galt Municipal Code removing two members of the commission residing outside the city limits but within the boundaries of Galt High School District. Agenda, Donna. Thank you. So tonight we have uh, Tina Hubert, the executive <coughs> assistant from the administration office who's gonna be giving the agenda report for you guys tonight. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. On February 20th, 2018, City Council discussed Chapter 2.70 and Chapter 2.75 of the Galt Municipal Code regarding qualifications for the Planning Commission and the Parks and Recreation Commission. Currently, two members of each commission may serve outside the city limits, but within the boundaries of the Galt Joint Union High School District and within Sacramento County for the Planning Commission. City Council recommended bringing back an ordinance amending the boundaries of each commission. The amendment would require that commissioners of the Planning Commission and Parks and Recreation Commission must be a resident and registered voter of the city. These amendments would not impact any current Planning Commissioners or Parks and Recreation Commissioners. Vice Mayor Cruz requested information on resident residences of the commissioners for the last 10 years. The information in front of you is for the last 14 years. 
Only two Parks and Rec commissioners lived in the school district boundaries the last 14 years and only one planning commissioner. Are there any questions? Any question? Okay, we have some public comment. Thank you. Dan Denier. Let me get my notes here. Madam Mayor, members of the council, thank you for letting me speak this evening. As you may remember, I spoke two weeks ago on this same issue. Um, during the last couple of weeks, I've given it more thought, looked into it a little bit more, and I have a couple of questions, I guess, that I want you to consider before you make your decision on this issue. The first question I have is why? Why are you addressing this issue? Why are you making the change now? There's no good reason to change it. This is the way it's been for years. I don't see why you just leave it as is. You don't always need to mess with things. Um, my second question or point that I want to make, Galt has a population of roughly 25,000 people, plus or minus. When you have a seat open on one of these commissions, how many people apply? A thousand? No. A hundred? No. Twenty-five? No. So why do you want to limit the pool of people who are willing to apply for these commissions? If you make this change, that's what you're doing, is you're limiting that pool. Um, my final point I guess I'm going to make, any form of government, whether it be city, whether it be county, or whether it be state or federal, that wants to silence any group of individuals is wrong. And if you make this change, you're taking a voice out of the direction of this city. And you're taking a voice out of the direction of this community. So again, I'm here again two weeks later to encourage you to vote no on this issue. Leave it as it is. If it becomes an issue later down the road someday, then address it. But you don't need to do that tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hello. <clears throat> Good evening, members of council, Madam Mayor. I'm here speaking again tonight as a concerned citizen. I was able to look at a neat piece of Galt history the other day um, with some friends. It's a 1930 Galt High yearbook. It's pretty interesting. I actually looked at a few more from the 1940s and 50s. And I was, as I was looking through this, I noticed some names in here. Names like Marengo, Osso, Kennefick, Barsetti, Denier, Palandini. Families that have made their home here for generations. Most of these people lived outside of the city limits, more so in the earlier years. People that have shaped this community, that have served in different aspects of this community, people that are vested here. My question would be, I wonder how many sitting up there on council, or, or matter of fact, any of you in city government, probably have any relations in here? Probably none, but there's some in the, the uh, audience tonight, some descendants in there, and these people are still very much a part of this community. I've spoken to some of them this past week, and they actually are very disappointed and disrespected, to be honest with you at the consideration of this. They have a sm very small voice as it is in this community. They cannot vote, they cannot hold public office, which obviously that's not gonna change anytime soon. But they do have a minority opportunity on these two commissions, two seats out of five, to have some kind of say and input. I've spoken to some of them that are farmers, business owners, they have families they've raised here, some for almost 100 years, like the Palladini family, for example, the Denier family sitting in the audience tonight. They shop here, they spend their money here, their money, their tax dollars for their homes go into the general fund, or the school district, excuse me. Their tax dollars, they buy, they shop, they're, they shop for groceries here, they're, they're, they do all their stuff here in Galt. Those are money that goes to the general fund, that goes to things like Measure R, for example, for the police, which they don't use because they live in the county. So the con their contribution is great. 
This municipal code has actually existed for a long time and it has worked the way it is. These seats, again, I say that are just a minority representation, but now we talk about taking that voice away and shutting the door on these people. This is not the first time this ordinance has been brought up to be abolished. In 2009, Councilman Meredith tried to do the same thing and it was met with resistance by some of our most popular council members and mayors such as Barbara Payne, Randy Shelton, and Daryl Clare. These people firmly opposed this change because they knew and understood the value of the input from these individuals. In closing, I want to remind each one of you up there why you're here. People voted to put you guys up there, not because they thought you were the smartest people, not because they thought you had all the answers. They put you up there because they wanted you to be the voice of the people. They wanted you to represent them. And I'm not just talking about the people that voted for you. I'm talking about the people that didn't vote for you, the people that live in the county that can't vote. You represent all of them as well, not just the people that cast their ballot for you. Many of those people are here tonight and you're representing them. So if you live on the west side of town or the east side of town or you live outside you know, on the other side of a speed limit or a city limit sign, you uh, all are part of this community. We are all GALT. We all call GALT home. We all write down GALT California 95632. We are a community. Do not alienate these people tonight and take away their voice and drive a wedge in our community by telling us which one of us have a right to be a part of this community and which don't by saying that some of us are more vested than others because that's what you're doing. You know, people say, Sean, why do you speak? Why are you up there fighting for these people? I have no personal um, effect of this. I live in the city limits. So why, why speak? Why say something? I speak because my grandparents were dairy farmers here and they didn't live in the city limits either. And though I do and I can have all these great privileges, they did not. And I know there's a lot of families like those people here that are still a huge part of this community and still will be for generations to come, hopefully. So I say to you, think long and hard about what kind of message you guys are sending with this vote tonight, because we're listening. Galt's listening, these people here are listening. And you don't want to send the wrong message. Thanks. Mr. Palandini. I'm Jim Palandini. Um, my kids' kids are six generations. I got seven grandkids. I got one more on the way. I've been here a long time. And I just 80. My dad's 80. And anything we buy affects us. I got only 40 employees. There's a few in Nevada, but 30 some employees here to have houses. And everything we do is here. When I was on the planning commission, it's still on record. They were going to throw me out. But we made it where two people could be outside the city limits and three could be on it. That's probably still in effect. When Walmart come in, I used to drive tractor on that ground. You think I like, I like growth, I like different things? No. But when you're here, no matter if we live outside of town or in town, we have to think what's good for the people. I can see a um, Rayleigh sign, Walmart sign for my house now. I don't like it, but that's progress. And when I was on the council, I mean on the, on the planning commission, I did everything for the people. Just because I live out there doesn't mean I'm somebody different. So I think if you look at the record, and all I'm asking everybody to really think about this, because we mean a lot. We may not be here. We do a lot of donations and a lot of things we do behind the scenes, but we are Summer Gold. And we were here before the 1900s. I tell you, we are Summer Gold. So I'm very serious about this. So please think about it. You know, because that time when I was in planning commission, about the time of Walmart, I had to vote for that. It took a lot, but we finally got it through. But just think about it, what it affects us. And it means a lot. I know I'm a little talking a little shaky, because it really bothers me. Don't don't change something that doesn't need to be fixed. Thank you. Good evening, City Council members and staff. Um, my name is Leo Van Warmerdam. I'm representing Van Warmerdam Dairy, which um, is on McKinsey Road. My father immigrated over here in 1947 and uh, worked for several people and 
1953, he started his own business and worked his way up and became a prosperous business member in Galt, along with you know the, the others here in town. I think um, we're probably a little younger than most of Jimmy's and Farmer's and Daenerys' ancestors, but um, I think it's, it's important that the council keeps the, the two seats open. Um, maybe there hasn't been a lot of interest in um, people running for the, I mean, not running because it's an appointed position, is that correct? Yeah. Um, but if that's what it takes, I mean, if those seats remain open, were they just not being filled? Is that why the ordinance needs to be changed? Uh, what, what's the reasoning behind it, I think, is the biggest question I have. And if it's, it's because you're not getting any support, I'll fess up with my friends here that we'll make that happen. Um, if, if we need the representation and, and um, if it's going to take us stepping up and being those representatives, then, then we're going to do that. But I think it's important that this seat remains open. Um, I mean, the two seats remain open to, you know. And we have property that is adjacent to the, uh, the property that the city owns out there on uh, McKenzie and Mingo. So those decisions are going to affect Jimmy's property, Deneer's, Van Warmerdam's. And I think that we should have some input on how the future development goes that way or what's done with that property or how we can you know mesh together to make it you know prosperous and functional for all of us i mean we're running equipment down the road and and um you know uh, you've got uh, um, traffic you know that's that's you know so i think that it's it's very important that you know those seats remain open and if we all need to um, uh, step up to the plate and fill those positions i think that we can do that so I'd just like to consider your vote and um, try to, and consider leaving it the same. So, and everybody else that spoke before me, I I did owe everything they've said. They, they did an excellent job, and you know that's just my extra input. So, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Clark. <laughs> Ms. Clark. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council. My name is Julie Clark, and I'm here to uh, add my input to the current topic. So, every citizen of the United States should be fully vested with the ability to participate in the democratic processes of each layer of government they find themselves affected by. I can be a citizen of this country, this state, this county, the city, this neighborhood. None of these layers carry rights of exclusivity. Concerning the present issue, limiting the ability of residents who reside outside the narrowly drawn city limits from having a say in matters which affect them is concerning. The purported benefits of this current proposed change have not been adequately described or explained. Each member of the council is charged with the sacred duty of giving voice to the interests and concerns of their constituents. To be effective in that capacity, you must be willing to suspend your own interests and opinions in favor of the interests of the people. When a proposal is brought to or by the council for consideration, there should be absolute transparency with regards to the true purpose of the proposed change. The reasons for the proposal must be clear and the intention must be sufficiently described. If that information is not provided to the public, speculation and cynical conclusions are likely to emerge. In the present circumstance, I find myself asking who initiated the change and for what purpose? And more importantly, who benefits from this change? And is there a connection between those who, those who initiated the change and those who stand to benefit from the change? One would hope that the motivation was rooted in altruistic intention. At the last council meeting, members of the public presented an unassailable defense against the suggestion that those Galtonians residing within the city limits have a more vested interest in those matters of planning and recreation. No other explanation or justification was given to explain the need for the change. The city has annexed acreage in the past, extending city boundaries. Those areas were formerly considered outside the city of Galt. According to the vested interest logic, decisions about those areas of land were made by individuals who at that time did not have a vested interest. Why should members of the Planning Commission have the ability to make decisions about projects which lie outside the city boundaries 
while not allowing those people who actually reside in those outlying areas to have a say in such matters until such time that the land has been formally annexed. I respectfully urge each council member to, dis to determine why are you supportive of this change? Whose interests are being served? Are you following the will of the people? In this day of heightened political awareness, the future security of your positions and the potential success of your political aspirations hinge on how well you listen to what your constituents are telling you and how willing you are to respond accordingly. Thank you. Thank you. I have no further speaker sheets. Any further public comment? Okay. Council? Ma Madam Mayor, if I may. What? If I may speak. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Council. Um, in regard to the information I asked for prior to the uh, council meeting, I found it interesting that we only had three in a period of 14 years, three members of the county involved in the, either of these commissions. And if you sit down and think of the numbers, that's less than a quarter of a percent of the population that was, that's there. 34 people, three out of 34. Um, I did not have the privilege of being here on the 20th. I was actually trying to chase down money for our city. But I've had a little time to think this over and I've had time to talk to other people about this. And a couple of things really, I, I guess a better way of saying it's irritated me. Um, one of the comments made was that people in the city limits are more vested. To me, that's subjective, okay? If you own property in the city of Galt, are you vested? What about the person who rents in the city of Galt? Okay, what about the business owner who lives in the county who builds a business in the city of Galt? Are they vested? I would think so, otherwise you're gonna go broke. Um, as far as a nexus, for me, the nexus has been and always will be a sense of community. Galt is not just a city. <coughs> It's very, very unique in that it is a community. When citizens, both inside and outside of this, this community get together, they seek one thing, a common goal, and that goal is to further the community of our, our city, of Galt. Um, what do we get out of it? We get out a sense of belonging. It's greater than the individual parts. Now, a lot of the things I had to say have already been mentioned by other members out here, and I really applaud that, but I too, honestly, wonder why this was brought up. It doesn't matter whether the boundaries are city limits, sphere of influence, city, city zip code, high school district. In the end, the decision to who represents each council member here is the responsibility of that council member and this council. I won't go any further as far as what I thought as far as the waste of valuable time and staff monies because to me it's more important for us to chase down the things that really matter to this community. Uh, just recently it was brought to my attention that our wonderful governor, even though he had a uh, tax initiative shot down in committee, has tried to do an end run and put it on, a, on the, uh, a trailer bill which would tax your water. But guess what? He's going to make this council responsible for it. We should be chasing that down. And that's all I have to say about it. Mark, Mark you, you know, obviously you, you know, made a couple comments that were directed at me without using my name, which is I, fine. I, I don't, um, I don't choose well, names. Well, apparently, you know, I used the word vested when the initial discussion came up. And the initial discussion, if I'm not correct, and or maybe you can correct me, didn't the council ask for this to come back at a much earlier date and then it was put on the agenda? Correct. Asked back in December 19th. Yeah, we that, that was committee. by the full council. Correct. Full so council. to answer your one question there, Mark, you were part of the decision to bring it back for discussion. Okay, so don't pretend this is new information. Well, I'm not saying that. Okay. I'm, saying, I'm saying the way it's currently presented here is a travesty. No, you said you didn't know why it was even brought up. This. The whole issue. We brought, we brought the issue back up, yes. Yes. Okay, but not to limit people. I, I, I'm not going to debate it. We, we brought it up to discuss it. Well, that's what we're here for, Kurtz, to debate. Yes. The, the other thing was is I made the comment that I felt that residents of Galt would be more invested, more vested in, in the process. When I made that comment, uh, it was intended to me, those are people that are property taxpayers, they are rate payers, they pay water, they pay sewer, they pay storm drain fees, they pay city mellow roost fees, they pay lighting 
landscape districts. So I felt that on that level, they have a vested interest in what happens in this community. Not that it was meant to exclude other people that live surrounding the community of Galt. That was never my intent. That wasn't my definition. So a lot of people have jumped to a conclusion that uh, I'm only interested about those individuals in the city of Galt. Well, that's, that's, that's far from the truth. Um, and I understand this is a community. Uh, and it does involve people in, in the outside and outside and outlying areas, including San Joaquin County. So just to just, just kind of set the record straight, those were my, that was my thought process, but no one bothered to ask. So that's fair enough. Right any further comment? Any other comments? Um, yeah. And when this was brought up originally, I thought we were going to look at everything. And when it came at the last meeting, it was already it was like a decision to ban everybody. And I understand there's a lot of people vested in this community that haven't lived in the community. We've got Ida Denier, who was the volunteer of the year. We've got Gail, who was the volunteer of the year. They do not live in the city limits, but yet they do a lot, but they don't have a voice if we vote this way. Um, Frank the Tank was kicked off the beautification committee because it was discovered he didn't live in the city limits. So he got kicked off the beautification committee. Um, since this is at the discretion of the council members to appoint and then the council gets to vote to approve, I think we should leave our options open to the discretion of the elected council members who they'd like to appoint and not make this an ordinance and maybe even look at the beautification committee and change that to allow two people out of the city limits. Tom? Oh, everybody's looking at me. <laughs> Do you have any comments? <laughs> uh, I think it, it's, it's, and this is what the council intended back in December, it's good to bring things like this up periodically just to review it, just to get the public comment, to understand, you know, if, if we're still on the right track. Things change. Things change every 10 years. So it's good to bring it up, air it, have the discussion. That's what we're doing, okay? At the last meeting, there was discussion on, um, you know, there's a definite, I think, a definite nexus between the sphere of influence and the city, obviously. But thinking you know, a little deeper into it, like uh, when Rayleigh's came to town, Rayleigh's did not look at the city. They looked at the area, the economic area. So then you start saying to yourself, okay, you've got uh, business people that don't live in the city but they still do business in the city. They probably pay business taxes in the, in the city in some cases. Um, and we are a rural community kind of out, out, out by ourselves, so to speak, you know, in a, in, again, in the economic area. So there's a nexus there, a business nexus, I, I think. And then, of course, the council, up to the council to approve anybody that, that, uh, you know, that actually applies and they, have, they go through that vetting process. So my big hang up at this point in the question, and I think I'm gonna suck the city attorney into the conversation. Um, if you say something like uh, the area code nine, you know, 936 or area code, and the school district, the school district spans two counties. So how does that work spanning a county? I mean, uh, is, is there an issue with that? Well, I think there's not an issue with it as far as you've set up your, your municipal code to date. So the municipal code allows the appointment of a commission member who lives within the, the high school district. And since that happens to extend into portions of San Joaquin County, I don't think that's an issue legally, um, that that is allowable. Um, then it's at the council's discretion whether you want to use the high school district or the um, sphere of influence or the city limits. So I think this is with an area within your discretion. Okay. All right. I wanted to make sure that that question was asked and answered. So thank you. Well, like I said, the reason it was brought back was in December. It came up for discussion. We were looking at the board guidelines and the coal commission issue came up. So. Um, and actually, at the time in December, most of us weren't even aware that it was two council that it was two members could be 
outside the could live outside the city limits and that was one of the reasons why it came back in february for discussion was because we were unaware of that <clears throat> I, I think i just want to clarify for some people because some of the comments made i don't think they understand how we appoint somebody to a commission so we so each we, we have a number of commissions two of them being parks and rec and planning and each council member gets to nominate someone and then the whole council as a whole approves it. Um, I don't think I've ever seen somebody not be approved. If whoever the council member chose, um, if they met the qualifications, they were approved. I don't think I've ever seen in all my years of, <laughs> of uh, watching city council meetings and everything mm -hmm. else that I've ever seen anybody not approved. Um, so just for clarification, it's not like we have two seats that are reserved for county residents. We don't. And as Mark said, we've had very few county residents ever serve on the commissions because I think that most council members realize that um, we're elected by the citizens of Galt. And it is true that the citizens of the city of Galt are the ones that are paying the parks and rec fees and the lighting and landscape district and the parks and, and all of the issues. So, I mean, so there's probably a reason why very few council members have ever nominated, even though we've had people that live in the county apply to serve, very few council members for whatever reason, I, I can assume I don't know, um, have chose to have very few, very few of those people ever serve on the commissions or the parks and rec. I, I don't have a vested interest either way. I mean, I, I understand that the council is here to represent the citizens of Galt, um, to represent the people who live in the city of Galt, but I also understand that, you know, the county residents want to have a voice, and just as tonight, nobody is ever excluded from standing up and giving us their viewpoint, giving us their opinion. So I do think the county residents, same as with that planning commission, if they're against a development, you know, when we were doing the general plan, we had, I would hazard to say hundreds, it felt like, county residents speak before, speak before the planning commission and the city council at that time regarding the general plan and regarding the sphere of influence and regarding growth. And so I think that to say that we're excluding county residents, I don't think that was ever the intention. And I think that county residents are always able to give their voice. If I have a county resident call me with a concern, I take the call just the same as I would for a city resident. Um, so I, you know, I'm good either way. I mean, it's up to each, each individual council member appoints anyway. Everybody can apply. Um, it's up to each individual council member. My only concern is, is that if it ever happened that we had a large number of county residents applying for positions at the time in which we reorganize. And we, you know, it's done with the election. So, you know, in 2018, it'll be December when people will, whoever's elected in 2018 <coughs> in November will appoint commissioners. And um, so that's kind of my feeling on it. It's, I, I did hear last time, you know, I thought there was a point brought up that, that um, made a lot of sense to me that I really hadn't thought about. And that was the fact of business owners within the city of Galt who own property, who actually own, who actually have a physical presence. I'm not talking about internet businesses. I'm talking about people who are actually paying property taxes because they have their business here in town, that those people are, um, you know, probably as equally vested as, as um, county residents or as city residents because they are, they, even though they don't live here, they are paying those same taxes. They're paying lighting and landscape and they're paying property taxes. It's the pleasure of the council. Well, and also, they, 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 when it comes to the business owner, that whether they live in the city or not, um, they are more affected by what actions the city takes. Therefore, they would uh, naturally want to be more involved, and that only makes sense um, from a business perspective. I, since the last meeting, you know, I have thought about this, and I had a similar thought process um, uh, regarding businesses because businesses are unrepresented. Uh, particularly if they live outside the community. Most people, most people that own businesses have not historically applied for the commissions, simply because they're probably too busy, I suspect. I'm not sure. Um, but I've also thought about um, the number of people that I know in this community that don't live in the city, 
that are very, very active in various civic organizations. Um, and that does uh, bind the fabric of a community. Um, does that necessarily mean they need to be on the planning commissioner or rec commission? I, I don't know. Um, the, when, I, when we last voted on this, it was, again, I felt that that time um, that the most, most, most individuals who would be interested would be city residents. Um, you know, clearly uh, from the history of both the commissions, um, there have not been many appointments. I mean, you know, three out of 33 or 34, whatever it was. Yeah. So it's not as though uh, it's an issue of, of someone gains something. I think that comment was made. It, it, I don't think anybody benefits. I think it's just a matter of what this community believes its uh, uh, commissions and boards composition should be. Uh, and, if, and if we have a uh, greater uh, sense of community, say then, uh, it, it, take Elk Grove for an example. Um, if someone lived in uh, Sacramento City, I don't know that Elk Grove would necessarily want a resident of Sac City on one of their planning commissions. I don't, I, I don't know, but it, to me it doesn't make sense. Uh, because they have uh, more of a physical boundary and uh, there's a very uh, a definite line of demarcation. Uh, if not, uh, you can't tell it from the, from the urban scape, but you certainly would probably have uh, different political ideologies, uh, I, I would think. Uh, here, I don't think, I think that line becomes very blurred uh, between the city and the county. So I, I uh, um, you know, after you know some thought and after listening to some of the comments, um, I I am not uh, wedded to the idea that it would exclude county residents. I'm not sure that I agree with the boundary. I think the boundary is is huge, and I don't know why it would be that huge, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's a it's a ar somewhat arbitrary boundary, I guess. Um, I think that pretty yeah. much concludes my comments. I, I, had a, I, had a, I also discussed the uh, Parks and Rec Commission with uh, Amondo, and um, you know I asked him point blank. I said, "Have you, have you ever had a problem? You know, I mean, is, is you know, is there an issue?" And uh, he pretty much said, uh, "You know, it's not broke." <laughs> so the council can decide to take no action, or do I have a motion? I move we leave it as is. As it's currently written. Second. Actually, can I clarify? We're taking no action. Yeah. We don't need to. Take, we don't no need action. to do a motion. Okay. No action requires and does not require that, a motion. If we have a consensus that we're not going to take any action, yeah. then that can be that. Or if we have a motion. Consensus. How is it currently right now? If we don't take an action. Like oh, that. just so we all know. Nothing happens. Nothing, the ordinance would remain as is, it stays which allows as is. up okay. to two within the Galt High School District. Okay. And it does say and within Sacramento County. So as Just for the Planning draft, Commission. Yes, for Planning Commission. And Parks and Rec? Uh, Parks and Rec. Is the high school district, including I think, I think Parks County. and Rec is a high school district. I would like to change beautification. That item would have to come back. Yeah, yeah that would have to come back. That would have to be back. brought back. Yeah, sure. Yep. That's not a. Do I have consensus from council on that one? We have consensus to take no action. Yes. Motion. Yes. Okay. Okay. Aye. Next <laughs> <This> item. <laughs> okay. Um, and what about the item of beautification? Did you guys want to uh, review that one as well? All of them again, or not bring it back? Don't we do that at the end of the meeting? She just mentioned it right ah. now. Yeah. I would be open to the idea. So what? There's a motion and a second to bring the beautification. We can, no. no, we don't need. We don't. We, we don't need the, a motion. We can second. Bring the, okay. Well, when we looked at it in December, didn't we look at all the commissions then? I thought that's what we had done then. Okay. We did. We did. We can bring it back again. So future at a future time. Okay, subject, community benefit funding grant policy, applicant qualification. Donna, report. Wait, the, Go ahead. At the last meeting, City Council uh, directed staff to bring back the community benefit funding grant policy for further discussion and possible action on the type of organization. Currently, the grant funding policy limits applicants to 501c3. 
on March 6, which is the last meeting, the city attorney suggested applicants that are in the um, IRS 501C3, 4, or 7 organization uh, typically serve public interest. And so we've brought those back um, as well tonight for further review. Also, city council directed staff to bring back the organizations that had received a fee waiver during the last year. Um, did you also want to speak on the organizations that are being considered tonight? Sure. So the types of categories, excuse me. Sure. There's, so there, as um, the city clerk noted, there are the different categories. Um, there was some discussion as to over, regarding the different types of 501Cs <laughs> because there are so many. Um, and that's where I noted that I'd seen some other places have opted to expand beyond the 501C3 to, for example, C4s and C7s, which tend to also do more public, uh, public types of projects and work. Um, obviously, it's within your discretion. Um, I've heard some describe, though, the 501C3 is sort of the gold standard because it is more for charitable organizations. Um, they aren't uh, allowed to influence legislation as part of receiving a 501c3 uh, status um, and take part in political activities. 501c4s um, may, to some extent, have a little more leeway in political activities. Um, 501c7s are uh, groups like sororities, fraternities. Um, they could be uh, uh, youth youth um, sports leagues or even homeowners associations so they can they span a lot of different areas so if you 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 were interested in expanding the types of 501c's that you would consider eligible for this grant you would want to then make sure that the the program and the requirements also specified you know what you were wanting them to do so for instance if a 501c4 could <laughs> is allowed under the 501c4 requirements to participate in political activities. If that's not something you would want for your community benefit grant, then you would want to make sure that the, the requirements for the grant also laid out the specific projects that you would consider. As you can see in the agenda report, um, the chart for the nonprofit organizations, uh, 13 of them are 501c3, 4 or 501c4, 1 is a 501c6, and there are uh, zero for 501C7. Uh, um, staff recommends City Council review these additional tax-exempt IRS categories and determine if uh, it's warranted at this time to include more categories and then take action by amending the policy if so desired. Any questions for staff? We have one public comment. So, Barbara Payne. Good evening, Council. I'm here for the Galt Community of Character Coalition, which is a 501c34. And I'm hoping that you will consider mm -hmm. expanding uh, your um, requirements for the donation or the grant. Uh, the Galt Community of Character Coalition is an organization that uh, charge no dues. We're just basically uh, community members that are trying to make Galt better. Uh, some of the ways that we have done that, um, they, we sponsored the community garden, which I'm happy to say was uh, featured in the Sacramento Bee this weekend as one of the features of Galt. Um, we also sponsor the Heritage mm -hmm. Festival, which we are trying very hard to appreciate the diversity and the different cultures of our community. Um, and then we recognize individuals for being are for just, uh, demonstrating good character traits like honesty, integrity, pride in community. So I think you can see that our focus is on the community of Galt. We charge no dues. Uh, all of our funding for any of our events, we go out to the community and ask if they will uh, sponsor our event. Uh, and we've been successful, I believe. And I'm not sure why uh, you would want to say a 501c3 only. So I'm hoping you would consider a 501c34 as well as maybe some of the others. Sue, do you want to say something? Well, the only thing I'll, I'll say uh, to add to what Barbara said, and I pardon me for being here, but I am, <laughs> um, <laughs> is that uh, we were assigned as a C4 rather than a C3, and I think it's probably uh, correct to do that. 
And we have done, we have participated in a lot of things in this community and support the community. So I hope that, you know, from what I heard from what Donna said, I think you were considering C4s and maybe some of the other Cs too. So that would be fine, I think. I think you should. We actually brought this item back, Barbara, because of the concern you brought up last year, because we were unaware of that it was only C3s and that you guys had gotten the designation as a C4. Which, when you read the definition, it, it's understandable why they designated you as a C4. And, and actually, it's something like 27 501Cs. Yeah, there's something. 27 categories. Yeah, some, I mean, some, it's yeah, it's just... Yeah. Well, I just want to say I appreciate that you are looking at it and uh, giving us an opportunity to tell you why we think we should be included. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Any further public comment? Okay, Council? Discussion? Well, I'll go first, I guess. Um, in the past 18 months, there's been nothing but 501C3s and 501C4s um, that have taken advantage of, of the waiver, fee waiver. So it, I mean, that, that almost, I mean, that says, that kind of says it right there. Uh, the C7s, which are youth organizations, I'm looking at the two here that couldn't tell us what they were, but there are two of them look like they could be youth organizations. Like the Galt Junior Warriors? Yeah. And so that, that would include this, uh, the C7s. The outlier of the whole bunch is uh, C6. Soccer leagues, too. So I, I think that's the discussion point at this point. I think it's kind of self-explanatory when you look at it, except for the C6. That's, that's the question I have. It looks like the softball girls are C3. Maybe that... They so sports leagues and I mean uh, groups can apply for different types with the IRS and there's different requirements uh, with the application process. I don't profess to be a, an expert on the nonprofits and the different categories, but I think there's you can um, file to become a 501c3. Uh, you might become a 501c7 if you're social and recreational. You might not meet or want to meet some of the other requirements or limitations on 501c3s. So it's, it's often at the decision of the applying entity or sometimes at the IRS when they look at what, you're, um, what, you, what jobs you're doing and that, uh, like Rotary and Kiwanis, for instance, are often 501c4s, like the mm -hmm. character of coalition. So those are, okay. those are just different factors in why. Um, the 501c6s uh, tend to be, uh, represent more business interests. Um, that's why you have the Chamber of Commerce. They are business leagues. Um, they include trade associations, professional associations. Well, I think because of the limited number that have been applying the past few years, what, two and three groups, I think it would behoove us to open it up to make it available to more of the community since it is a community grant. When you look at the policy regarding the community grant, it does talk about... Um, it being for um, specific projects or events, which I think is mm -hmm. part of why you might have less people applying, because uh, um, it's not just a generalized anybody. It really was specifically um, geared toward events, special events and, pro and projects. Correct? That's, I mean, that's my interpretation when that's I, the way read. I read it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so many of these organizations, or lots of organizations, wouldn't. But, but maybe you know, I understand that the the community garden. I know last year it was the issue was about um, having an event for the or having getting funding for something at the community garden. But <clears throat> I'm actually in favor of of opening it up to more than just the C3. I, I mean, it does appear to be that a number of these organizations are C4s. Mm -hmm. And they're all, I mean, all of these are organizations that, uh, you know, do good things for our community. Um, so I, you know, they still have to meet the criteria of it being for a, a certain event or, and there, I mean, there's lots of criteria. It had to be, you know, to benefit the community. I mean, I think it was interesting that, uh, I mean, it was that their principal meeting place had to be within the city of Galt, you know, organized and established for a minimum one year. But, uh, I don't know if we say that we don't define that their membership has to be part, has to be from Galt. No. Yeah, because 
one of the council members had requested uh, Elk Grove's qualifications, and they actually have the qualification that they uh, that they yeah. the majority of the membership have to live within the city limits. I thought that was, it, yeah, I thought that was interesting. Limited to just 50 C3s, I think. Too. Yeah, three, yeah, yeah, they just, just limited threes, it yeah. to C3s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I'm looking at, at the usage of the last 18 months, and it's been both 5013s and 4s. So, I mean, it, it makes sense to, based on the last 18 months, you know, we include those two. The Like I said, the 501C6, I think it's a discussion point, and maybe whether or not we want to include seven. For youth, for youth groups, but and sports teams, if they're. But if you, you know, I, I, I guess I, I don't see a problem with sports teams. But if you have to have, if it's a specific project and it's not for ongoing maintenance and operation, I mean, it's very clear in the in what the guidelines say. Yeah, it's not for I, general I fundraising. No. It's not for yeah. those kind of issues. It's for specific projects or a specific event that would benefit the wider community. Yeah, I'm. I'm open to to opening it up to to. Uh, well, it looks like three, four, six, and seven are the ones that have had any. Um, yeah. 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 But they still have to meet the other criteria. They still have to meet the other criteria. Sure. <clears throat> but it, you know, that limits that that kind of narrows the field down from the 27 different 501 Cs or I don't know, is it 27 or is it 37? 29. There's a bunch of them. It's 29. Yeah, off the off the top of your head, uh, this to you. Uh, how many of these types of C three, C four, C six, C seven, whatever? How many of them can have political action uh, committees as part of their organization? Uh, I don't know on all of them. C threes, I know, uh, cannot attempt to influence legislation as a substantial part of its activities or participate in campaigns, which is a large reason I think why a lot of entities limit it to 501 C threes because they aren't involved in that. Um, 501 C fours um, can have more involvement in political activities. It doesn't mean they do. Um, just that they, under the IRS rules, they have a little more leeway to be involved in those. So. If there's interest in expanding it to 501c4s, one item might be to add as a qualification where they can't discriminate, obviously, in protected categories, that the, that the funds also not be used for any political activities. And there's always the concern about gift of, of public dollars. I mean, that because many of these grants are, are a gift of public funds, and we have to be very careful about um, how we're spending the public's dollars. I mean, there is... I know when we talked about in the past, you know, I, when they come on the past, you know, when we talk about, um, you know, specific religious organizations, mm -hmm. there was concern that that was not benefiting the general public because it's a gift of public dollars and does government generally give money to religious organizations? I, I know that's what we had, we had some concerns about that in the past, but, but. <laughs> Religious organizations are 501 C3s. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I think that's why though the Community Benefit Grant Program ha was um, organized to require that the funds, you have to show that you are using the particular funds from this grant for a community benefit project. And that it has to be a resident 501 C3 so you know it's an involved community. But obviously you, you, can, you have the discretion if you'd like to expand some of those requirements or add additional community benefits you know, specifications, um, but those are also factors you can consider when you, the applications come before you, and that is what makes this not a violation of any gift of public funds, is that you have tied this to community benefits, so that is not an issue. That's a good point. Any further discussion? Do we have a motion, or? So moved. And what do you so moved what? What are you moving? What, what, yeah, what's the motion? <laughs> uh, we will add um, 501c4, 501c6, 501c7 to the qualifications of the community grant. Does that sound right, Ms. Kirk? And leave 501c3s in it also. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Okay. Yeah, yeah. okay. So, so everybody's clear. It's three, four, six, and seven. Correct? Yes, ma'am. Your motions to open it up to, okay. Do I have a second? Second. 
Yeah. I just have some further discussion. You know, these organizations that were unable to confirm their um, their category, it seems to me like they need to be able to show what their organization is. If they're if they're applying under a nonprofit, that they actually just just having good standing with the IRS doesn't yeah. necessarily tell us what kind of organization they are. So. I just think that we need to. What do I, they have to tell us to apply? that they either have to tell us or that well, yeah. they just aren't yeah. part of. They just aren't part of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. we can't provide the well, documentation. I mean, it, that's one of the requirements. Is that uh, uh, that's one of the requirements. The application, right? That's part of the vetting process. Yep. So. Yep. So the city clerk's office, on a routine basis, uh, uses the franchise tax board letter of good standing, that shows two things that. They're in good standing and also that they're a tax exempt organization. So that's what normally we put up in print and include in the packet. What Does do it show what, what their classification is? I mean, because you can be tax exempt and not fall into one of these categories. Right. Well, there are in this agenda report the um, franchise tax board. I'm going to back up to it again. Um, codes that match up with the IRS code okay. in the beginning of the agenda report. But there were a couple of them that didn't come up um, the way that they should have, and that's why we went back to the IRS 501c3. That's exactly what the policy says, and so you can also find that out from the IRS website, although all it says in that um, website is that it's active. Well, well, yeah, but these people are required to file tax returns annually. So they Not don't. necessarily. Well, if it, Do you want to speak to that? Go ahead. Well, it depends, I think, on the amount of revenue they're bringing in That's correct. Um, correct. That, as to whether they have to file a tax well, okay. return. So there are... Assuming, assuming yeah, the they tax loss right. is complicated. <laughs> um, what we could do, what my suggestion would be, is that we bring back the policy, obviously, with the amendments that um, have been approved tonight the, to add the 50C4, 6, and 7, um, and the application requirements. We can add that the applicant provide proof of being a 501C3 mm -hmm. um, and good standing four, under four, the... Five, six. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Yes. Or, sorry. Of their of their appropriate right. IRS standing um, and include that with application requirements, but we can bring it back to make sure that that meets what you had intended with the motion tonight. Yeah, now, I don't think I don't think it should be the clerk's responsibility to run down what their status is. I mean, they should know that. They, they should know. Yeah. Present it. Yeah. So. I would assume they they have a treasurer, and I'm assuming the treasurer would know. Um, yeah. One, it, one issue is that the community benefit well, fund grant is due to go out the first week in April. So could we not include in the motion all of these? Mm -hmm. No, this isn't in the motion. We're just, you know, we didn't change the motion. Adding, no, I mean adding, uh, you're suggesting to bring it back one more time. However, mm. the policy reads that it goes out before the next meeting. Ah, I see. Yeah, well, then. <laughs> it's an issue, which is why we're discussing it again tonight. Okay. So if it's just limiting it, the changes to now to adding 50C, four, six, and seven, mm -hmm. uh, along with the 501c3s, then we don't need to bring it back. We can obviously, to meet the, the application deadlines, and then consider cleanup at a later. Uh, clean, yeah, clean up later. Right. Yes. And that's fine. Perfect. It, but, but at the same time, they would, they would have to meet that requirement. Correct? Yes. Okay. Well, because I think that there was some discussion last time regarding the fact, and, and not, not to with this, but the whole discussion about our definition of what is a nonprofit. Correct. Because it's different with every policy. It appears to be that we have different criteria on different policies. And that, I mean, part of the suggestion was that we look at having a definition of yeah. what we're going to say is a nonprofit. But that's. That's not with this. <laughs> no, but, but that, that was part of that discussion. That was part and of the discussion. Because Parks and Rec was using day. one definition, yeah. Yeah. the city clerk's office is using another definition, mm -hmm. and that from a policy standpoint, that we need to have a much clearer definition. Right. I believe that's coming back sometime in May. Yeah. Yes, I believe so. That's kind of what started all this, was there was different definitions. Any further discussion? So I have a motion by Council Member Lamson, second by... And choose one. Yeah. <laughs> Kurt him. Kurt him. <laughs> yeah, second by Councilmember Cruz or Councilmember Molson. Which one? 
Council Member Molson. Okay. okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Call for the vote. Vice yeah. Mayor Cruz. Aye. Council Member Molson. Aye. Council Member Campion. Aye. Council Member Lamson. Aye. Mayor Hewer. Aye. Pass this 5 0 vote. Okay. Comments by staff? Emily? Oh, before we move on, I do have one other comment. Okay. Excuse me, I'm sorry. I was looking at thinking it was a separate agenda item. Under the, under the policy itself, um, I, I think that we should at least address what has been our practice. Um, it says that the, the funds uh, must be expended within the grant year, July 1 to June 30th, or they revert back. Mm -hmm. um, we've had to do, uh, I know the council's approved it, um, uh, extensions um, mm. uh, be, because of you know, valid reasons. Um, the Historical Society, for example, couldn't get permits from the county in order to move forward, therefore they couldn't expend the funds. So I don't know if there's some sort of an exemption or, or just uh, an exception uh, for, for legitimate and valid reasons. I mean, I, I don't think that it should be, oh, we just didn't get around to it this year. There should be a legitimate reason to, to, to be able to extend it, but I think the policy needs to acknowledge okay. that. Something to that extent. When we do some more cleanup language, we can bring That's that fine. back at this That's fine. Time. That's fine. Something to the effect of That's a good point. has to be expended within the year unless prior approvals <clears throat> Of the council? Something, yeah, let them wordsmith it, but yeah, something to that extent. Okay. Yeah. And we know how government works, so I can understand that happening. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Chris? <laughs> Steve? Just uh, continued community awareness uh, that uh, we've got the large Safe Routes to School project that's uh, disrupting uh, a number of neighborhoods as we kind of make, harden our dust. Uh, or our mud holes, as the case this past week. Uh, uh, work will continue uh, as weather allows, and uh, uh, it'll be a project that will continue through the summer. We do have a website set up on the news feed on the city's uh, cover website that you can click right to and get weekly progress updates and uh, an indication of what's to come in the week ahead. If, if your community uh, or your neighborhood is uh, affected by that and you want the latest information, please visit the city website or call the Public Works Department. Can we post that on our Facebook page maybe every week also? Thank you. And thank you for joining us, Tina. <laughs> Do you have any other comments? Thank you. <laughs> Cora? Nothing to add. Thank you. Lieutenant, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you. And we have nothing. Well, that's the first thing. More to add. I have nothing further. Okay. Comments by city council members and future agenda items. Kurt? I have nothing. Paige? Just like to say thank you to everyone that showed up. It's nice to see some friendly faces out there. <laughs> Tom? I have nothing further. Mark? Sure, put it on me. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. Um, I would like to have something brought up to uh, at the next council meeting for. Uh, for us to take a look at and whether to support it or uh, oppose. It appears that uh, there may be an attempt to uh, repeal SB1. Whether or not that happens, there's a currently a proposition in position called Proposition 69, which would, if left in place, make sure those funds remain in transportation. 41% of the funds currently coming out for, prop for uh, SB1 are not assigned, which means our lovely people up in Sacramento can do whatever they want to with the money. Yep. So I would like to have that brought up again and have, have uh, council review it. SACOG wants support for it, and I flat out told them, I can't do that. I represent the city of Galt, and without the council's approval on that one, we're not going there. The other item, and I, and I talked to the city manager about this, is um, was a water tax. Yes, you heard that right. A water tax that made it, made it to a subcommittee and, and died miserably. Um, right however, so. our governor decided to attach it to a, to a trailer bill to the budget. So I would suggest that council step up and make sure that they know that we are not happy with this because ultimately they're putting it on the backs of the ratepayers and blaming city councils. Well, would it be appropriate to have uh, staff draft letters to send to I think it'd be an ideal I, I have both both of these to pass on for yeah. staff to use then yeah. I would suggest that we do that I can take a kind of direction wing draft letters and 
um, or we can bring back to the council for further discussion at our next meeting uh, April 17th. Well, the water tax is actually more critical, so that might be something that have have a letter draft so we could uh, approve it at next meeting. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yep, I would agree. Okay. We'll I would too. Back. We'll bring those both back. Yeah, you know, we we kind of get tired of being the messenger up here when Sacramento does stuff like that to us. <laughs> so just so everyone remembers, this Saturday is extravaganza. So I hope the community comes out and. I guess we can keep our fingers crossed about the weather. Doesn't, Bring your umbrellas. Doesn't look. Uh, It'll be fun. <laughs> yeah, but the Easter egg hunt for the kids and wonderful family Free events. Plate. So Free please plate. come out and support it. Friday, right? Uh, I think that's it. 23rd? Meeting adjourned. We're not. <laughs>